Okay, we're on. All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. It's a pleasure to have uh, today Dr. Rick Blum from uh, University. Uh, Dr. Blum received his BS uh, and his uh, PhD from the uh, University of Wisconsin, Pennsylvania uh, in Philly in uh, 1991. Uh, from 84 to uh, 91, he was uh, at uh, GE Aerospace and he's been at Lehigh since 1991. Uh, his research is in statistical signal processing in general, and uh, uh, he's also greatly involved in uh, smart grids, uh, communication, sensor networks, radar, you name it. He's in there. And uh, he's also uh, served on the editorial board of the IEEE Signal Processing Society, as well as the Communication Society. Uh, he's uh, he's uh, led the edited, uh, we edited uh, several special issues, and uh, he's also uh, a member of several technical committees of the IEEE SP Society, and, uh, and he was, uh, uh, a, oh, he is a fellow of the IEEE, and he was a DL, IEEE SP DL, a distinguished lecturer of IEEE, and he's also, uh, honored, he was also honored with the third millennium Mellow uh, of IEEE member Eda Capanil and Sigma C uh, is an inventor of several patents and uh, he also received the Leona Young Investigator Award as well as the NSF, I guess what they call now a career award, but at that time was the Research Initiation Award. And uh, it's a pleasure to have him here. Thank you for coming. The floor is yours. Thank you, Hamid. Yeah, I'm sorry I sent you all that information to read. And uh, <laughs> anyway, thank you for going through that. It's really a great pleasure to be here today. I'm really honored to uh, come talk to such a great group. And I you know, have some great respect for Hamid and a lot of the other faculty here at uh, NC State that I know. And are, I know they're really, really good. And so this is a great honor for me. I thank the, in the inviters for the invitation. I'm going to talk today about some work on cybersecurity for sensor networks, which I think is a very interesting topic, and I think it's uh, been a lot of work on cybersecurity for various issues. I think this might be one of the topics where there's a little bit less work, and I was talking to someone today, probably, you know, I, I always call, talk about this as sensor networking, but a, a, as, the, as with the person I'm talking to, this is going to be clearly, you know, in the future, the Internet of Things, right? Cybersecurity for the Internet of Things, which hasn't seen a lot of attention, I don't believe. So uh, I'm at Lehigh University. Lehigh is midway between Philadelphia and New York uh, City and a nice location. Get a chance to come by and see us sometime. This is work with uh, myself, my graduate student, Jen Fang, who really carried most of the weight here. Another graduate student, Basil Alnajab. And I'm also collaborating with Lance Kaplan from the Army Research Lab uh, on most of the work that I'm talking about here today. So um, let me get started and try to lay out the problem. Uh, so we're interested in this talk, we're particularly focused on sensor networks or Internet of Thing networks, if you want, that are trying to estimate some parameter. You know, my background is signal detection, signal estimation, so I'm kind of focused on that. So we have some like physical phenomenon that um, is being monitored by a set of uh, capital N sensors and each sensor takes a set of observations, maybe at the J sensor, the number of observations are K sub J, right, time observations. And then each time observation is individually quantized. So at the J sensor, we have X sub J K is its um, continuous operate, uh, <coughs> observation, if you will. That gets quantized to U sub J K, which is the quantized observation sent on to a fusion center. All the observations from all the sensors that are individually quantized go to the fusion center and is trying to estimate some parameter theta. And uh, what we're looking at is cases where adversaries take over some group of the sensors and attack them. And they either essentially in this, for the purposes of this talk, they either kind of change the information going into the sensors or they change the information coming out of the sensors. And the, if they change the information coming into the sensors, we call that a spoofing attack. 
Uh, I'll give you maybe some examples of spoofing attacks a little bit later. Uh, but for example, I guess you can do this in a radar. You can uh, have sort of an electronic memory which would, would take a signal that's, tran you know, the way radar works, you transmit a signal, bounce off an object, you figure out how long it takes to come back. That's how far away the object is. Well, if you take the signal that's reflected off the object, store it in a digital memory, and then change the delay, you can, you can essentially mess the system up. And this is a spoofing attack, and this, this kind of thing has been looked at. The other attack we call man in the middle attacks, you're essentially changing the data that comes out of the sensor. Um, you could do that by taking the sensors over or maybe just intercepting the communications. So these are the two kinds of talks that we'll look at, both spoofing and man in the middle. And the first, first part of this talk is, is mainly based on some asymptotically optimal estimation of the presence of man in, in, in the presence of man in the middle attacks. And the work is uh, documented in a IEEE Transactions Journal paper. And uh, essentially, the, the second paper here kind of generalizes the ideas. You'll, you'll see what I'm talking about here. So here's the overview. We're, we're going to look at a case where there's man in the middle attacks. And we're, we're focusing a lot on sen systems here which quantize data. All, all, almost all real systems uh, use digital uh, communications and, and digital electronics, and they tend to quantize their data. And you'll see there's some interesting things when you specifically look at the quantization, which uh, haven't really been, been noticed quite yet. So we have uh, man-in-the-middle attacks. We have a system which is trying to estimate a parameter with quantized data. We're going to assume that there's P, capital P, different, distinct attacks on the system at one time. P is arbitrary. Uh, we're going to first try to identify and categorize the groups of sensors that are differently attacked and which sensors are unattacked as well. And then we'll try to do a joint estimation of the parameter that we're trying to estimate, which originally we're just going to look at as a simple scalar parameter theta. Later on, we'll generalize this. And we're also trying to estimate any parameters that come about through the attack, and you'll see how this works. And it turns out if we just use a simple estimation approach that I'm going to uh, show you first, uh, you can actually do it. The FIM turns out to be singular. The Fisher information matrix turns out to be singular. But you can easily fix this. And it, it really, the problem here is we were just using a fixed threshold at each sensor. And if you just change the threshold over time at each sensor, uh, then you can get around this. And, and, and what we basically come up with the end is necessary and sufficient conditions for cases where the sensor data that's under attack can help you, right? So does the sensor data under attack help you or not? We can tell you if that's the case. So we're going to try to make things as simple as possible here in the beginning. So we start out with this uh, model. Uh, this is without attack. And uh, we simplified it so that at each sensor, we're going to basically uh, have k time observations. And we have cap capital K time observations. We have capital N sensors, right? Each sensor, again, takes uh, at the J sensor, uh, it takes an observation x of jk, little k, and quantizes it to get u sub jk. And then all these quantized observations are sent to the fusion center. We look at a very simple case where um, we have, I don't know if I should walk over here. Maybe not, right? Yeah, that's fine, I guess, right? OK, so we have uh, the observation x of jk is, is just a scalar parameter theta plus noise. We assume that um, the noise is independent, identically distributed uh, over time and over sensor. We assume that uh, there's some additive noise which has a zero mean, known PDFF, known CDFF, capital F, right? P known PDF, small f, known CDF, capital uh, F, right? Trying to make things as simple as possible. And we're going to look at binary quantization. So. The use of jk is just basically uh, 1 if x of jk is greater than this threshold tau, and otherwise it's 0, right? So very simple model. And all of this, I guess, is extended in this other paper that I showed you the reference for, where we basically look at a general parameter estimation problem, not just this theta plus noise, right? So it could be a radar problem, whatever, as complex as you want. And we look at uh, non-binary quantization. So we pretty much generalize it as much as we possibly can in the second paper. But let's keep things simple here to make things easy to explain. So if there isn't any attack, 
then we can write the probability mass function at the output of a quantizer in, in a nice form, closed form, just depends on capital F, uh, the threshold, and theta. And uh, if we assume uh, some reasonable things here, right, we can come up with this so-called naive maximum likelihood estimator in closed form, right? And this na naive maximum likelihood estimator is just the estimator that you would use, the maximum likelihood estimator you use if you assume there isn't any attack, right? And so uh, it turns out it's asymptotically unbiased, efficient estimation for theta under no attack, right? But uh, what happens if there is attack, right? So let's start out here looking at the man in the middle attacks. The man in the middle attacks are going to change the data coming out of the sensor. And if you think about it, we're producing these binary symbols. What can an attack do? All it can do is flip zeros to ones and ones to zeros, right? And you could categorize that by sort of a probability transition matrix or a diagram like this, right, where a zero could be flipped to a one with some probability. Maybe it's not flipped with another probability, right? And so there's essentially two probabilities you have to worry about here, right? Because this one and this one have to sum to one, right? So you have this probability, that probability, and you can write the mapping between the probability uh, mass function of the quantized data before attack and the probability mass function for the data after attack with just this multiplication by this probability transition matrix, right, with these two parameters in there. Uh, this is, of course, for the pth attack, right? We have P equaling 1, 2, up to capital P, right? And we have a little bit of notation here uh, for these probability mass functions. So this is going to be the probability that the quantizer after attack produces a 1. Notice the tilde on there is after an attack. And uh, on the other hand, uh, when we don't have tildes, we're talking about before attack. So this is after attack, before attack. Okay. So we make a bunch of assumptions, uh, not really, uh, and, and introduce some notation. So let's let uh, script A sub P be the set of sensors that undergo the pth attack. Let's let phi sub P, I didn't make that very clear, but we're going to call the probably transition matrix for the pth attack uh, phi sub P, right? So phi sub P is the probability transition matrix for all the, all the uh, different uh, capital P attacks. We'll, to make things easy, let's let script A0 be the set of unattacked sensors, and it could have a probability transition matrix of the identity matrix. S sub T is the set of all sensors. And a bunch of assumptions here which are kind of reasonable. I know there's a lot, and it's a lot to look at. But you know, basically, the idea here is that um, the fusion center that's going to make the decisions doesn't know script AP, and it doesn't know the uh, flipping matrices, the probably transition matrices, you know, uh, for all the P attacks, capital P attacks, we want to have the size of script AP as N becomes large be a fixed percentage of the total number of sensors so it doesn't shrink to zero and become a set of measure zero. We don't want things like that. Of course, these sets should be disjoint. Uh, in this uh, analysis here, we assume that the flipping matrix is independent of phi, so the attacker does, uh, ind independent of theta, right? So the attacker doesn't actually know the true value of theta. You could look at that case, but I think this is probably a, a more reasonable case to look at. And then we make some assumptions here that the set of unattacked sensors is larger than any set of attack sensors, and there's this fudge factor in there, delta zero. We assume that the, uh, any set of attack sensors is larger than some factor delta, right? And we assume that if there is an attack, then the probability transition matrix is changed by some factor so that the attack is sort of I impactful, right? It's not uh, negligibly small. It's larger than some value. Of course, these values, the deltas, zero, delta, and these Ds are, are arbitrary, and you can set them however you want but it's nice to have them here, right? So if there's different attacks, they're also different by some D diff, another sort of impact factor. And then it's kind of a minor thing is that if an attacker always flips a, 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 a binary value to zero or always to one, that would be too easy to detect. So we don't look at that. It actually uh, is not worth looking at and causes some weird mathematical problems anyway. So we don't look at that. So let me define two families of sets of sensors, right? So this, this C0 is the set of the family of homogeneous sets of sensors, right? So these sets are all the same. They're either all unattacked sensors 
or they're all sensors that are attacked exactly the same way, right? And then this other set, C1 kappa, is, 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 is trying to characterize something, the rest of this, the rest of the world, right? The sets of non-homogeneous sensors, but it has this little restriction that we don't care so much if really small sets of sensors are different, right? So C1 kappa really is the set of, uh, the family of uh, non-homogeneous sets of sensors. So it's all sets that include uh, two parts that are either attacked differently or one of them's unattacked and one of them's attacked and these sets are bigger than kappa, right? So we don't want to look at things less than kappa. You know, it, it turns out we don't really need to, you'll see. So given this, we come up with a lemma. I know there's a lot of stuff here, but let me just, you know, it's not very complicated. I can lay it out. So basically, if we consider some subset of sensors J, which are in the intersection of the C0 and C1 for some kappa, and we, you know, we define this lambda, which is going to be a threshold, which depends on these uh, D, D, D factors, D impact, D difference that I showed earlier, and the PDF of the noise, which is F here. Uh, that gives me this threshold. I want to consider a hypothesis testing problem. I'm trying to figure out whether the set of sensors I'm given J belongs to C0 or whether it belongs to C1. That's the hypothesis testing problem I want to solve in this lemma. And I have a test t statistic here that will do that uh, when it's compared to this threshold lambda. So the test statistic, what it's doing is it's looking at the naive maximum likelihood estimate for some set S1 and subtracting it with the ne subtracting from it the naive maximum likelihood estimator for some set S2. And it's only looking at disjoint sets. And it's only looking at sets that are uh, at least size kappa. And um, it looks at the soup of, over all sets of this difference. And it turns out that we can show, if you um, define pi 0 and pi 1 of the prior probabilities of the two hypotheses, and if you have enough observations k, so if they're greater than this factor here, uh, I won't go through the details of it, but this is actually uh, a large deviation uh, exponent uh, in, it's derived in the paper. Uh, so if you have k observations, then you can show uh, more than this, k is larger than that factor, you can show that the probability of error is bounded above by some constant and then an exponential, which is it decreasing, negative exponent, uh, exponent here, is decreasing in k and n, right? So if you pick k and n large enough, you can drive this probability error as small as you like, right? So that's kind of the, the, uh, the gist of this, and the, the proof is in this paper. Um, and I didn't mention that we have actually a math professor that's collaborating with us on that. Helped us make sure the large deviation proofs were right. Uh, so, so with that lemma, then we can have this theorem. So the theorem says that for any n, as k going to infinity, the fusion center is able to identify sets a sub p for p equals 0 to 1 that, you know, down to sets of probability measure are correct with probability of 1, right? And uh, the second thing, so, so basically, for any n, if k goes to infinity, you have enough time samples, things work perfectly. On the other hand, if you have uh, k time samples, which are larger than this, but you have a finite number k, and you let n go to infinity, then it turns out the fusion center is able to determine p, capital P, the number of attacks, and it's, be able, it's able to come up with some approximate sets, a sub p with a tilde on the top, that are close in some sense. This equation basically looks at the percentage difference and says it's smaller than its value. And so, you know, you can sort of adjust k to make this as small as you want. So what it's telling you is that when you make k large, everything works perfectly. When you make n large, it, it doesn't quite work perfectly. And if you think about it, it does make sense why this is happening. So, you know, having more time samples is kind of different than having more sensors. When you have more time samples, right, you already have a sensor with a certain number of time samples, right? And now you're, you're given more time samples. You're sort of given uh, more information about something that was attacked or wasn't attacked, right? And so it's kind of helping you. You know, if you, if you already had some good idea whether it was attacked or not, you get these more time samples. Then you can look at, again and say, oh, yeah, it definitely wasn't attacked or, you know, something like that. The other hand, when someone hands you a new, new sensor in our model, right, because we have each sensor being attacked or not being attacked, 
then you're sort of given some information without having any information about whether it's attacked or not. So it's like a, it's more data you're getting, but you know now you have another unknown. Is that sensor attacked? So the you know the first case you're not added another unknown. The second case you are, and of course we could actually have changed the model and made uh, a different model where every single time sample was either attacked or not attacked. You know, so at a given sensor, maybe sometimes you're attacked, maybe you're not, and then this would go away. But the way we pose the model, which we think is reasonable, to say a sensor is attacked or not, you have this interesting kind of difference between K and N. Okay, so what we've kind of said so far is, is that you can figure out uh, or categorize which sensors are attacked and which sensors are attacked differently. And then the question is, should you just take all the attack data and just throw it out and use the unattacked data? Or is it sometimes helpful to use the attack data, right? And remember, the model we have, which is very reasonable for this, for this model, right, is that you're just flipping ones to zeros and zeros to ones, so you have this probability transition matrix. So the key is, can you get the probability transition matrices and try to use that to do something with the attack data, right? And we'll, we'll look at uh, analysis of, along these lines using kramer outbound because it's much easier to deal with uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's basically intractable if you don't use uh, something like a CRB. So what we have now is we have the scalar parameter theta that we want to estimate, and then we have all of these flipping matrices or probably transition matrices. Each one of these has two parameters, right? There's P of them. So we, we can look at a bigger parameter, a, a capital theta, which now has dimension 2P plus 1. And if we go ahead and we calculate uh, because we want to basically calculate the CRB, right? So we can, we can calculate the Fisher information matrix for estimating this capital theta, right? And the way we do that is we take log likelihood, uh, we form a matrix that the elf nth entry of this matrix would be the derivative of the log likelihood with respect to the elf component of theta and the nth component of theta, take the expected value, there's a minus sign there. We do all that and we get a very simple formula, it turns out. And the formula, what's interesting about it is it's basically a, a sum of outer products. The outer products here, this phi sub p, are essentially the derivatives of the probability that the attack sensor decides for one given each one of the parameters of the capital theta, right? So that becomes a vector. Here's an outer product here. There's a sum of p plus one outer products. So the rank of that at most could be p plus 1, but we have a dimension here of theta, which is 2p plus 1, so we're in trouble, right? The FIM's going to be singular, right? So the reason uh, this happened here is because of the quantization we use, where we use the constant threshold at each sensor, and you can easily fix that, right? So this is the, the theorem here says, uh, you know, the FIM is singular in this case. Uh, I won't interpret it. It's kind of easy to figure out why it's singular. If you're interested, I'll tell you. The way to get around it, well, there's actually many ways to get around it, but one simple way to get around it is you take all your data, right, and instead of using one quantizer at each sensor, use Q, right? So you break your data up into groups, use this qu a threshold for the first part, this threshold for the second, that threshold, right? So it turns out if you do that, things work fine. Now, you can sort of uh, see this, right, because, well, you can see at least that it, that it might work because... Essentially, if you try to write the FIM, you get ex essentially the, the, the exact FIM you had before, but you have a sum of K of these different FIMs, right? Every time you change the threshold, it's like a new problem. And so you have the sum of the FIMs that you had before, but you have a sum of K of them. So that if that K is right, you know, then you have more outer products here. It might work. And it's, it's deeper than that, right? It turns out if you look closely at what's going on, you will have uh, basically a full rank FIM as long as you use basically two thresholds, right, because of the way things are working here. So, so if you look at that um, vector in the outer products, right, this, this phi vector, right, basically it's the derivative of this probability that the sensor produces one uh, with respect to each one of the parameters, right? The parameters are theta and the uh, parameters of the attack matrices. Right, and there's, remember, there's p different attacks. So theta is of dimension 2p plus 1. So what you'll find is that the first entry will be non-zero. Whoops. The first entry will be non-zero, right? When you take the respect of theta of this, you get non-zero. 
then there'll be another, the two-peath entry will be non-zero from this, and the two-peath plus one entry will be non-zero from this, and all the other entries will be zero, right? So it's only three non-zero entries here. So essentially, uh, if you take this sum of outer products, you can play a little game here. Uh, you can use this matrix identity, which says if you have a sum of outer products, you can write it as a product of two matrices. And the matrices are basically just take all of these vectors in the outer product and make them the columns of this matrix. Take all those vectors, make them the columns of that second matrix. So that's uh, what you get here. You get this matrix, which is made up of the columns of these phi vectors. And you can maybe, if you want, put this into one matrix. So it turns out, essentially, this matrix can have at most three non-zero rows. And this matrix, this is sort of like the square root matrix of that, if you will, uh, will have at most nine entries. So it's actually very easy to show that you will get full rank and that these, uh, because of the properties of a CDF and because you're changing the threshold, by the way, I mean, there's a, some assumptions here. The noise that we're looking at is sort of um, some kind of continuous noise function. In that case, you can show that these, these uh, columns will be uh, linearly independent and you'll get full rank if you have at least two thresholds. And not only that, because there's only a few entries here that are non-zero, it's actually possible to get a nice closed form expression for this FIM. So that's kind of what we have here. We have a theorem that says if you use at least two thresholds at each sensor, you will, uh, in fact, get a non-singular FIM, the way we're doing things. And the other thing that we're saying here is that if you calculate the CRB for using this approach with the varying thresholds, you can actually obtain a nice closed form expression for it, right? So the CRB would be take the uh, Fisher informatics for J, take the inverse, and then look at the 1-1 one, one entry because you just want to estimate little theta. And this is actually the, uh, the expression you get. And you can see if you're, a, if you're a MATLAB guy and you like this notation, right, this is picking out those non-zero entries of that matrix uh, tau sub P. And that's how you get a nice closed form expression. So this is great. We have a CRB for the performance uh, when we use the, the uh, time varying thresholds, right? The thresholds that change uh, the Q of them in general. And we can uh, basically compare this to the CRB we would get if we just throw out all the attack data. And we can basically use that to figure out whether attack data helps us or not. In fact, if you look at this expression, it's actually uh, contained there. That's the term. Uh, the first term there is actually the CRB when you throw out the data. So if you take the ratio of the CRB that uh, throws out the attack data to the CRB that uses the attack data, you get this CRP relative gain, which is this closed form expression. And if this guy is greater than one, then the attack data is helping you, right? And if it's, if it's not greater than one, it's not helping you. It will never hurt you. But it, won't, but it won't help you. So in fact, you can actually look at this and figure out when it's going to help you. So it turns out you, we have a theorem here that says the, if the rank of either this matrix, uh, this is kind of the square root matrix of tau sub p, uh, probably abusing notation there, but uh, or this tau sub p itself, if it has rank 3, right, then you can see this determinant is going to be non-zero. Right? The denominator is always uh, actually uh, positive. The determinant here is always fine. But the uh, determinant here um, could be zero, right, unless this matrix uh, tau gamma sub p or, or F, whatever this is, sigma sub p, I think, is of rank three. Uh, if it's of rank three, this will be non-zero. So the theorem says uh, you can utilize the attacks observations in our proposed fashion and get improved performance if and only if the rank of this matrix or that matrix is three for some attack, for some P. Otherwise, you don't get any gain, right? And uh, here's some quick results, I guess, uh, on trying to show you numerically this kind of makes sense. So we picked a particular example, 10 sensors, theta is 1, tau is 1, these, these delta 0, delta parameters, you know, pick them to be 20%. It doesn't matter. You can pick whatever you want. Uh, let's pick additive Gaussian noise with a normal distribution, standard normal, right? Zero mean unit variance. Let's say that uh, we have uh, two attacks, and this is the attack on 30% of the sensors. This is the attack on 20% of the sensors. Run a Monte Carlo 200 times. Look at the average percentage of misclassified sensors 
versus the number of time samples k. And you can see that you know, this is kind of that first lemma trying to show you that it does look like that this uh, average percentage of misclassified sensors is going to zero as k becomes large. Here's another uh, numerical comparison trying to see whether it helps to use the attack data, right? So this is the one that uses the attack data. This is the one that does not. 100 sensors, theta equals 2, uh, standard normal again. Uh, what we're going to do here is we're going we're to pick um, these groups of 10 uh, sensor observations to use a given threshold, right? So then we pick these different um, number of thresholds. And basically, what I'm going to do here is increase k, right? So I could use, uh, you know, starting at k equals 400 to k equal 800, right? So this is the number of thresholds I use. Again, the first attack is, in this case, 25% with this flipping probabilities, 20% with these flipping probabilities. Here is what happens for the CRB if you don't use the attack data. And here's what happens if you try to use the attack data. So you see some gain. By the way, I'm sort of sweeping this under the rug. But it, there are some cases where you will never get uh, any gain from the attack data. Oh, I think I have it here, right? Oh, I don't have that. OK. Um, so, so there are some like strange cases here. So if you pick the two flipping probabilities to sum to one, uh, then the rank is always less than three. And uh, if you can see it by looking at this, this probability uh, that the sensor produces a one, because when these sum to one, Basically, the first part goes to zero, and then this probability that the sensor produces a one doesn't really depend on theta at all, right? So there are some cases where you can make the attack uh, basically make all the data worthless. But usually, uh, that's not the case. In any other case, it's not. OK, so quickly now, let me jump to another topic and now look at spoofing attacks. And, and this is something where Lance, uh, actually, Lance was involved with the first paper. And he told me to take his name off it because he didn't think he did enough. So he's a very reputable person. But he actually contributed to that as well. But here he, he, he let me keep his name on the paper. So uh, this is more about spoofing attacks. And this is different because now we're looking at things from the attacker point of view. As opposed to looking at the things from the estimator point of view, we're trying to figure out, can we find attacks so that the attacker is guaranteed, no matter what the estimation system does, he's going to get a certain amount of degradation in the estimation, right? So that's kind of what we're going for here. Functional forms of optimal tax is the title. You'll see why that, that's uh, here. That'll take a while for that to come out. So with the spoofing attack, right, we're going to change the data coming in. So now we're interested in the continuous data that's coming into the sensors, right? So you know, at sensor J and time K, we have an observation X of J, K, which has a PDF, which depends on theta, right? And uh, you know, the rest of it's very similar. Right? We're going to take all these uh, observations, quantize them, send them to the fusion center. Uh, we're pretty much now looking at uh, an arbitrary um, estimation problem. right? So now we don't have any assumption about theta plus noise. right? All we're saying is that theta is some parameter of the PDF of the observations. right? And uh, again, we assume independence over j and k, just to make things simple. And the parameter theta now can be a vector, right? And uh, has dimension d sub theta. And the, the quantizers now don't have to be binary. So um, we assume at R sub j level quantizer at the jth sensor so that there are, there are uh, R sub j regions, right? And what you do is you, you look at the observation. And if it's in the little rth region, then the output of the sensor is R, right? And little r could be 1 to R sub J. So that's a general uh, quantization approach. And uh, they don't have to be binary, I don't no, no binary, right? Yeah, no binary. And, and regions. So you just you can have as many regions as you want. You can have 10 regions, 100 regions, whatever, right? And we, we generalized the other stuff in that second paper, but I didn't talk about it. Same way, right? Same, same way. We just look at general uh, estimation problems. Non-binary doesn't matter. So for the spoofing attack, what's going to happen here, though, is that the attacker is basically going to change the data coming into the sensor. So if the data has this at sensor 3 has this PDF F sub 3 you know, with a parameter uh, theta, after the spoofing attack, it's going to have some different PDF, G sub 3. right? And it's going to have uh, a tilde on the x, so we know it's attacked. And not only can it have a parameter theta, but it can have an attack parameter also in there. right? 
tau, right? So that's the, the that's the difference here, right? So it's it's down here very clearly. So uh, under the pth attack, again, we'll have capital P attacks, right? Uh, all of the attack sensors have the same uh, attack vector, right? Tau superscript P, and they all have the same PDF. Essentially, they're all manipulated the same way. I'm sort of avoiding talking about how you manipulate the data, but you know, if you know F and you know how they manipulate the data, then you know uh, G, right? Essentially, and uh, okay, I think that's about it. So uh, here's a similar notation, right? A sub zero, a, a script A sub P, just as I said before, but now all the sensors under the P of attack will have this attack vector, which has a certain dimension. D sub P, and to conform to the work that's out there in the literature, if people know about like Lang Tong's work and all this other beautiful work on Smart Grid, uh, it all basically assumes that you know uh, the functional form of the attack, F sub J and, uh, and G sub J. So we're going to assume we know those. And still, we might want to know later on what are the best manipulations, and we'll, we'll get to that later, right? Uh, so, so, uh, so the um, estimation system knows these two things, and uh, it doesn't know the, the, the attack parameter, though, tau sub superscript p. It has to try to estimate that. And the adversaries also have no information about the computations the fusion center is using. So you want to try to find attacks that are good no matter what the fusion center does, right? So we want to be able to guarantee attack performance independent of the computations performed at the fusion center. And so it turns out there's a nice way to do that that we found. We sort of stumbled on, and then we realized that this is actually a very, very meaningful way to do things for many reasons you'll see in a little while. So what we, we did is we said, well, let's look at trying to maximize the CRB for the case where I'm able to categorize all of the sensors into differently attacked groups and unattacked groups. So I know these script A, P, P equals zero to capital P. Right? And so I maximize the CRB for that. I find the attack that, that, you know, that's going to maximize that, that CRB. And it turns out that if you think about it, uh, never can you do better than that, right? Because uh, if you don't know the script A sub P, it's just you know, going to degrade performance more, right? It's just a lack of information. So this is beautiful. It provides kind of a nice bound, right, so you know that this maximized CRB, which is going to be bad because you're maximizing it, right, that's the best you could ever do, right, so that's the best the estimator could ever do. So the attacker knows he can't uh, guarantee that the performance in terms of CRB will always be larger than that, right, or at best that if, if you can figure out what these, these sets are, right. Now, we've, again, focused on CRB, and nobody really questioned me yet about that, but I think it's uh, intractable kind of not to do that. So, so I think we're confident in that. So what we do is we define these attacks that I, just, that I just mentioned here, the ones that maximize CRB for the known sets, A, script A, P, uh, P equals zero to capital P, as guaranteed, optimal guaranteed degradation spoofing attacks, OGDSAs. Right, and uh, it turns out that we'll show basically that under OGDSAs, the attack data is useless for reducing CRB. Right, so there is something very interesting about these kinds of attack. Besides guaranteeing performance, they're kind of making the attack data useless. Right, so so it turns out when you get to the specifics of it, there's two kinds of these OGDSAs. There's one which we call inestimable spoofing attacks, where the FIM for estimating the attack parameter for the pth attack becomes singular, right? And interestingly enough, this really happens pretty much because of the quantization and the kind of quantization you use. Very interesting, right? You'll, you'll see later, I'll, 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 I'll show this to you, right? The other thing that can happen, which is very subtle, maybe it's not even worth mentioning, but we do. We call it a different kind of uh, attack. We call it an optimal estimatable spoofing attack, OESA. In this case, this fin will not be singular, but still you can show that the data is going to be useless for trying to uh, improve your estimation, right? And what happens here basically uh, is that if you look at 
you're trying to estimate this theta, which is a vector, and you're trying to estimate the tack parameter at the same time. You look at the joint problem of, of trying to estimate those, it's, it's not a, a well-formed problem. Uh, it's not going to be identifiable, essentially. What's going to happen is there's going to be some values of theta and the tack parameter, which are just as likely as other values, right? And you just don't know what to do, really. I mean, the, the tack has, has really uh, messed you up and made it impossible for you jointly estimate these two things together. Right? Even though the FIM is not singular, which is interesting, right? So, um, okay. So here's the first result, and this is the, the, the kind of attack where the FIM blows up, and we call these these ISAs or inestimable spoofing attacks, and they can occur pretty much based on the quantization system you use. So if the attacker knows the kind of quantization system you're using, he can launch an attack which is guaranteed to be one of these ISA attacks, right? So it turns out we can prove that for the peak spoofing attack, if the dimension of the attack parameter, d sub p, is larger than this quantity, which only really depends on the number of symbols or levels used at the jth quantizer, and the sum, which is summing over all the sensors that are under the peak attack. So if this d sub p is larger than this quantity, uh, which we call estimation capacity, then uh, the FIM is going to be singular, right? So as if, long as you uh, launch a complex enough attack, you can guarantee that the FIM will be singular and that the attack sensor data will not be useful to that person who's trying to do the estimation. And how could you launch such an attack? It's actually very easy. So here's just a, a made-up way to do it. Uh, what you really need to do is you need to take the unattacked data, this x of jk, and map it through some function which depends on essentially the attack uh, parameter entries, right? The entries of this matrix, as long as there's DP of them, in some way. So here I just map it in a certain way with a polynomial, right? But you could do anything you want and basically map it that way. Uh, the problem is uh, the system just is not going to be able to estimate these attack parameters anyway. So it's never going to be able to go from this guy back to that guy, essentially. Okay. So uh, I've gone very quickly and uh, hopefully uh, try to keep things at a high level. But uh, at this point, I'm going to get into a little bit of more detail. Uh, if I want to try to talk about the second attack that doesn't make the FIM singular but still makes the data useless. And so let me just try to run through this. Again, I won't get too detailed. But, but anyway, you know, again, you want to calculate the FIM for this uh, big parameter theta, capital theta. Right, which has little theta and all the attack parameters in it. And the way you do that is you take the log likelihood, take these derivatives. So this is the L mth component, right? It's going to be the derivative with respect to the Lth component of capital theta and with the nth component of capital theta. So if you think about that for a while, you're going to get this block matrix, right? And so you get this matrix up here, uh, J sub theta, which is basically the Fisher information uh, about theta, right? And the Fisher information about theta, uh, it can come from data that's unattacked. It can come from data that's attacked, any of these P ways, right? And so you could write it as a sum, right? And this is basically saying the Fisher information about theta is a sum of the Fisher information about theta under the pth attack. And, and P equals zero is unattacked, but, you know, this makes it easier, right? And the actual uh, equation for this is down here, right? And it, it's basically, again this sum of outer products, right? So these are pretty much the same outer products. Now I'm looking at non-binary, so it's like the probability that the, uh, the, the, the quantizer produces the R symbol, right? And you're looking at derivatives with respect to each one of the parameters, right? So again, it's these outer products, right? And then you have these other matrices along the diagonal. These are the Fisher information matrices for trying to estimate the attack parameters. They look essentially the same as this, except that Instead of having theta, you have tau sub p, superscript p in it, right? And then you have these other matrices, b's, which are basically cross terms, right? So they have one derivative with respect to theta and another derivative with respect to tau superscript p. And again, you can play a game with this, this matrix notation to write outer products, right? In terms of the product of two matrices, and you could write all of these outer products as the product of two matrices, right? This one is kind of looking at estimating theta, 
based on data that's undergone the PETH attack. This guy is estimating the attack parameter for the PETH attack, and this is that cross one. And I can do basically a singular value decomposition for this matrix here, which I might call the square root of the Fisher information matrix, and this one also. I might call that the square root of the Fisher information matrix. I do a singular value decomposition on it, and I look at these last two matrices, and it turns out that we are actually able to obtain necessary and sufficient conditions for one of these attacks, right, the ones that um, make the data useless but don't have the fin blow up, in terms of these matrices here, uh, the last two matrices in the two singular value decompositions. So it turns out, here's our theorem. Necessary and sufficient cases for OESA attack is that the range space of the last two matrices in the singular value decomposition for estimating theta for data that undergrew the PETH attack is a subspace of the range space of these last two matrices for estimating uh, the attack parameter for the PETH attack. And um, this is really deep and interesting, and uh, the underlying uh, story here is basically what I said before, that it's, it's sort of uh, unable to sort of uh, come up with a, a unique value for theta and tau sub p at the same time uh, that is like the highest likelihood. There's several values that are just as likely and you're sort of, you know, stuck and the range space stuff is, is, is telling you that. One way to sort of interpret the proof, I, I'm sort of laying out here to try to show you how this works, right? So if you really want the CRB matrix for this theta vector, the small theta vector, what you do is you compute the FIM for the big theta, take the inverse, and then take the first d sub theta rows and columns of that. And it turns out, because you have this nice block structure, you can actually obtain a nice closed form expression for that, which I've given you here. And then remember, this j sub theta can be written as a sum of the uh, Fisher information matrix for estimating theta when the data is undergoing each of these attacks, the pth attack, p equals 0 to 1. So you plug that sum in there, right? Take the terms that uh, are from p equal 1 to 0 out of this sum, Put them over here, right? So you're basically having uh, this guy uh, added to J sub A sub P, and the sum is from P equal 1. The only thing left is that uh, Fisher information matrix for the unattacked data. You can show that this matrix has to be positive definite, and you can show that when this condition is true, it actually is 0, right? And so all you're left with for the, for the CRB for theta is just the CRB using the unattacked data. So basically, this condition is, is basically showing you that the data now is useless at the attack sensor for trying to estimate theta. Okay, so uh, it, you can also use this to try to figure out what's the optimal functional forms to mess with the data and try to uh, cause a, as much of a uh, problem with the attacks as possible, and, and we have a, uh, uh, we have a, you know, I, I, this is a lot to get into here, but let me sort of give you a special case and you'll sort of get the idea, right? So let's look at a special case where theta and tau sub superscript p have the same size, and in that case, uh, you can create this by having these two square root matrices be scalar multiples of one another, right? So there's this gamma sub, lambda sub p, which is a scalar multiple between the two of these, right? So, so you know, of course, that if you think about it, that's going to create this. But interestingly enough, this is uh, also uh, you can show a necessary condition, sufficient necessary and sufficient condition for this is that essentially the way you're attacking. Uh, so, if you have an attacked P PDF function for X at the J sensor which depends on theta and tau sub p, it basically, with this attack, has to be looking like this. So it's some uh, PDF uh, of x, which instead of depending on theta and tau sub p separately, it has to depend on them in this linear combination, right? And if you think about, for example, lambda sub p equal 1, what it's basically telling you is you're taking theta and you're basically changing all the values of theta by adding this tau superscript p to it, and if you've thought about estimation before, you realize that's impossible for you to figure out which part, so basically the whole data depends on some parameter. Which part of that parameter should be attributed to theta and which part should be attributed to tau superscript p is impossible, right? You can, you can move parts back and forth 
and it's going to look exactly the same, right? So that's why we have this problem, right? That's why the data is useless. The estimator is not able to figure out which part to give the theta and which part to give the tau superscript p, right? So um, that's, I think, a very nice result that my student came up with there. And uh, this, is, this is really not depending at all on theta, the attack parameter, the, the quantizer regions. You know, it doesn't matter. You, you do whatever you want. It's, it's still true, this result. And in fact, this is also interesting because if you, if you ever looked at the smart uh, grid literature on attacks, we actually have a lot of, we have a DOE center on, on cyber attacks for smart grids. So we're interested in that as well. Uh, if any big power guys here, we, I'd be very interested to talk to you too as well. So um, turns out uh, what they do there in a lot of cases is they look at these so-called bad data detectors. So what the bad data detector it really tries to do is, you know, it knows the PDF of the data it's trying to observe. It doesn't know theta, right? So it t tries to figure out if the data it's observing will be of the right form, you know, has some PDFF with some parameter theta. It doesn't know what theta is, so any theta will work, right? Well, so if you use this attack with this g here equal to f sub j, this will pass a bad data detector, right? It, it looks like the right data with some parameter, and the uh, estimator can never know whether the parameter is wrong. So this will pass the so-called bad data detector attacks. And in fact, this attack is, turns out, is exactly the so-called stealth attacks that people have looked at in Smart Grid, right? So it turns out, Without knowing this, they just picked it. The attack they picked is actually a very good attack, right? It actually has some optimality in terms of guaranteeing the attacker will uh, cause a certain amount of degradation. So we like that. And then here's the last thing. So thank you for hanging in here. I know there's a lot of maths and FIMS, and you're probably not into FIMS and like we are. But um, here's the last result. And this, this basically is trying to say that after all this attack stuff, we figured out something fairly fundamental in terms of estimation with quantized data, which I've never seen. And lots of people have looked at um, estimation with quantized data. If you go look in the literature, you'll see tons of papers on this, right? No one has ever said this. It turns out that you can't really estimate very large parameters with quantized data, right, is what we found. And we basically found it from this uh, attack stuff we did. So here's the theorem, or it's not stated that way, but anyway, suppose I have N sensors and I have capital P different quantizers, right? So, so J equals 1 to P. Uh, the Jth one of these guys uses R sub J symbols or R sub J levels, however you want to look at it. It has R sub J regions, whatever, however you want to look at that, right? And so uh, when you look at the, 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 the Jth uh, quantizer group, right, that Jth group, it's going to observe m sub j different PDFs, right? So what I'm saying is that each sensor, um, sensors could observe the same PDFs, right? It could be an IAD problem, or they could be different, right? If they're different, that matters a little bit, right? If they're different, it's going to make it a little harder to, to uh, well, it's going to basically uh, help the estimation, it turns out. So it turns out that if you're trying to estimate a parameter cap uh, theta here, little theta, uh, with dimension d sub theta, if d theta is greater than this factor here, which only depends on the quantizer designs, right, the number of symbols in each quantizer and the number of different PDFs each of these differently uh, designed quantizer uses, then, in fact, the FIM's going to blow up, right? So this, this actually, you know, if you, you know, if you're thinking about big data, lots of people think big data is a big thing, and a, many of these big data cases, you want to estimate large parameters, you know what? There might be a problem with that, right? Because uh, the FIM's probably going to blow up. And you're probably going to use quantization. I don't see anyone talking about transmitting analog data around. People are talking about transmitting digital data. So this is a nice result. We like this. And we think it's very basic. And my student actually generalized the heck out of this with uh, dependent data and all different cases. But I think you get the idea from what we have here. By the way, he also analyzed why this happens, which is very interesting, but we won't talk about that. So here's the papers, right? So this is the, the first paper that we uh, talked about, the generalization, uh, the functional form one, there's some conference papers, and then the last part is in, in an information uh, theory, IEEE Transactions on Information Theory paper, which is submitted. I think everything's published but the last one because IT takes a gazillion years, if you know. 
to get anything through there. Maybe it'll never get through there. I don't know, but, but we're trying our best. So that's it. I'd be happy to take any questions. I thank everybody for listening, and I hope that you're not too fimmed out after all that. Uh, thank you. So, so you, you have no assumption about the upper bound for the attack, like a, a attack. I mean, you, have, you have a lower bound to make sure that uh, it is attack. But uh, why don't you assume some un, uh, upper bound? I'm not sure if I follow you. The first part was 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 basically on asymptotic output processing. The second part was on looking at things from the attacker's point of view and trying to guarantee that the estimation couldn't be better than, than some value, no matter what the estimator does. You don't know what he's doing. He could do all kinds of things, right? If you try to make an attack that's really bad when he does one thing and he does something else, maybe the attack isn't so bad, right? And so you, you, know, you probably, as an attacker, don't want to play that game, right? You probably want to say, I want to be guaranteed that I'm always going to get a CRB greater than something. So we talked about that. So, so what we're trying to do in the second part, if this is what you're asking about, is we're trying to uh, tell the estimator, I can tell you how to attack somebody, and you'll know, no matter what the estimator does, you'll always get um, CRB greater than something, right? Which and CRB is asymptotically achievable, and if you use like enough sensors, you get very close to it. So it's a reasonable thing to look at, I think. So that, that's where that bound came from. I think, it, you know, there was some bounds all over the place. There's bounds in the first part, too. But I think that makes sense. You know, I think it's a, you know, it's a cat and mouse game here, right? No matter what you do to attack, the estimator can also do things, right, to, to try to fight you off. You know, so you could look at game theory or something like that. But I think a reasonable approach is just a minimax thing and say, hey, I don't care what that estimator does. I'm always going to degrade the CRB to be greater than something. And the best he can do is estimate who's attacked and who's differently attacked, and then he can get exactly the CRB that I want him to have anyway, right? And if he doesn't estimate all that stuff right, he'll have a larger CRB. And it turns out that that, that approach is interesting because it, it's pretty much equivalent to making the attack data useless. There's nothing more you can do than make the attack data useless, right? As an attacker, what more can you do? Right? You can't mess with the unattacked data, right? I mean, he... He has that. that that's OK. You, you can just make the attack data useless. And, and if you make as much of it as useless as possible, you're in trouble. I mean, you know, in all these attack problems, if people attack too many things, you're in trouble. So what you've got to do is you've got to sort of protect some of the sensors. You know? And it's possible to do that. And I didn't talk about this, but we have some work on trying to basically uh, make the sensors uh, the data sort of uh, unattackable uh, and, and also basically sort of unreceivable uh, by other people. So these sensor data, people might want to look at the sensor data and try to get it and figure out what, you know, what, what's this data being transmitted. I want to do my own estimation of theta. So we have some work on how you can uh, stop that as well. I don't know if I answered your question, but I tried. Yes. So it seems that the uh, one assumption or a common assumption in literature is that uh, the uh, attack sensors is like a minority, right? Less That's a really good point. Less than like 50 percent. Really any, good any, point. Any thoughts? Like, uh, well, it's a really good point. And so, you know, in our work, in the first part thing that we did, we very quickly realized, so if you want to figure out who's attacked and who's unattacked, you need some extra information. So one piece of information you could have is that more of the sensors are unattacked than attacked. We kind of went that way. And that's fine. I think we made an assumption that we tried to make the weakest assumption we could, which was like the largest set of attack sensors is smaller than unattacked, something like that. Uh, there's other things you could do, right? The same kind of idea, protect certain sensors. If you know those sensors are protected, right, then you can sort of use them to try to figure out who else is unattacked. Right, so you need you need something, right? Because 
think, think about it, right? So I, I, I tell you there's these 10 sensors and they, they have distributions that look a certain way. And then there's five that, that have distributions that look a different way, right? So which one of those is right? You don't know unless you have this extra information. Maybe the ones that are, you know, larger or on it, you know, the larger set is unattacked, or you have like some that you protected. You, you know, there's a fundamental ambiguity you can never overcome. I think the way we view it. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. Perfect. Yeah, very good questions. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh oh. <laughs> You're going to scare me. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, the, the, in fact, it, it's kind of related to what, what That's a great question. Ju just asked, in the sense where, uh, you know, you 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 have uh, this uh, this uh, sort of aggressor in a sense uh, that, that that's gonna. So, can for instance, can, can your uh, uh, your framework uh, account for the possibility of uh, you know uh, uh, accomplishing what, for instance? Uh, you know, uh, uh, communication diversity. You know, in in uh, uh, in communication, we use uh, angle diversity. You That's know, a good uh, idea. Spatial diversity. That's a really good in idea. Otherwise, here you introduce redundancy in a sense. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, in a random fashion. Yes. Right. How can you come? You know. That's a. That that's way you can come back in, in some sense. I like that. Yeah. That's a really good idea. Yeah. So we actually tried to think carefully about how to get around this problem, and it's a fundamental problem. So if you're willing to have more transmissions or more data or secure sensors. That's another way I think you could, you could solve this. And that, that's actually a very interesting way. We should actually, we should actually do something with I that. Do I, do like that. I, I like that. I like that. I like that. That's great. <laughs> OK. Very good. I w that's a great idea. You know, trade off some of your, uh, I think you're going to have to do something. You're going to have to lose something somewhere, right? You could cost, have, uh, yeah. Cost, uh, yeah. At the very least cost. But, but, these, but these attacks are hard to deal with. You're going to have to give up something, right, somewhere. So you might have to do what you're saying. That's a good idea. Any other questions? If not, let's thank our speaker again. Okay, thank you, guys. The other question has to do with... The